get our Bibles, and uh, we want to read uh, once again from the Word of God, and um, that's what we're here for, to get into the Word of God. So it's Exodus chapter 26, and it's verses 31 through 37. And what we have here is the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies in uh, the tabernacle. So let's get our Bibles. It's Exodus uh, 26 and verses 31 through the end of the chapter. And thou shalt make a veil of Amen. Now, um, see, we want to look at the veil this morning and um, see the veil is mentioned six times in the New Testament. See, six times in the New Testament. Now, we're studying about the tabernacle because if you don't understand the tabernacle, uh, you'll have a hard time understanding uh, the word of God. Now, let's turn to Hebrews chapter nine and uh, see what the New Testament says there about this subject that we're uh, thinking about. Hebrews chapter 9, and uh, we read here in the first three verses, Hebrews chapter 9 and verses uh, 1 through 3. Now, let's read about it. See, uh, and of course, throughout the book of Hebrews, we read about the tabernacle as a great illustration of God's truth. Now, uh, it's Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Let's read it together. Uh, then verily the first covenant Amen. Um, and by the way, that word worldly simply means an earthly uh, sanctuary. And then uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, we have a tremendous, uh, some tremendous verses uh, here. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and uh, 20. Having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil and the same to say. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, what we want to deal with uh, this morning is uh, the next thing that we see in our uh, study about the Old Testament uh, tabernacle, and that is the veil. Now, the veil was simply a curtain, and it separated uh, the holy place in the tabernacle from the holy of holies in the tabernacle. So it was a, a, a curtain. So it separated the holy place from the holy of, uh, of holies. Now, uh, turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter uh, 26. We just want to make mention of some things here about the uh, Old Testament uh, tabernacle. So in uh, Exodus chapter uh, 26 that we read uh, the, this morning, we find that uh, we have a description here of the veil. Now, the veil was a curtain, and it simply separated the holy place from the holy of holies in the Old Testament uh, uh, tabernacle. Now, by way of uh, review, 
Now, um, again, we'll see this morning that, uh, for instance, a veil is mentioned six times in the New Testament. And a lot of times, if we don't really have a handle on the tabernacle, uh, we might not have a handle on a lot of the great New Testament uh, teachings. Because if there's any place in the Old Testament where God's truth is revealed um, in a special way, it is in the Old Testament uh, tabernacle. Now, um, as we uh, uh, study about uh, the tabernacle in uh, the Word of God. Now, keep in mind, this is the first organized way that God instructed the people to worship Him. So the first organized way now uh, to worship the Lord was found in the book of uh, Exodus here and in the tabernacle. Now, people before this worshiped the Lord, but they, they didn't have the tabernacle. And so this is the first way that you have an organized way that God is teaching His people how to um, worship Him. Now, as we think of that Old Testament tabernacle, see, the thing to keep in mind, see, you went through, the Israelite went through the gate, and um, the tabernacle uh, was a, a, a huge uh, a piece of uh, a property there, but there was only one gate to get into the tabernacle, and that, was, and that speaks to us of Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. So there's only one way to enter into uh, the gate. Uh, by the way, a lot of interesting things. New Testament talks about the robbers coming uh, and they don't want to go through the gate. They climb up over the wall to steal and to destroy. But anyway, then the first thing that the Israelites saw when he entered into the tabernacle was the brazen altar, and that is where they offered their sacrifice. And uh, so no Jew or Israelite would come into the tabernacle uh, without a sacrifice. And then the Jewish person that brought that sacrifice, whether a lamb uh, or a goat or a, a bullock, see, then um, he was responsible, not the priest, but the person had to slay that animal. And then the priest would gather the blood and uh, splash it, uh, the uh, uh, Hebrew word there is not sprinkle, but splash it all over the altar. So you see, and that uh, speaks obviously of the blood of Christ and uh, our uh, uh, need to come to the blood uh, for cleansing and forgiveness. And the next thing in that outer court of the tabernacle, if you have the chart, it'll help you to understand that in a better way, what we're talking about. And then you have the laver. And then um, before the priest could minister in the tabernacle, he had to wash his hands and feet, and he had to do that every day. And that speaks of how we need to be cleansed through the Word of God. Every day of our lives, we need cleansing. Not just once a week, twice. Every day, we need cleansing. There's no question about that. But then you get into what is called the holy place. Now, and that's the tabernacle structure and you get into that holy place, and there are three pieces of furniture in the holy place. Now, number one, there's a lamp stand, and certainly that speaks of Christ, the light of the world, but then it also speaks of the fact of how you and I, Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. The only way anybody can ever hear the gospel is through you. Say, no other way. Uh, say, we are the light of the world. And then you have the table of bread, and that reminds us how Christ was crushed and uh, how he was baked and how we need to feed on him. Much uh, could be said about that. And then, of course, the altar of incense is mentioned several times in the Word of God and uh, in the Psalms and in the book of the Revelation, and it always refers to our prayers ascending up unto God. Say, the altar of incense speaks of prayer being offered up to God. And then, um, then you have the thing we're looking at this morning is the curtain, the veil. And by the way, see that uh, prayer altar, the altar of incense was the closest thing to the presence of God. The only thing that separated the Israelite from the presence of God was the veil. 
and right outside the veil, against the veil, was the altar of incense, and you have the veil, then you have the ark and the mercy seat. And of course, in the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God dwelt, and you had the Shekinah glory coming up out of there, and that was the presence of God. And most everybody has heard or knows that, say, the priest only once a year could enter the Holy of Holies. And that was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And he had to go in and he had to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And uh, just once a year that was done. But as we look here in Exodus chapter 20, uh, 26 and um, verse, uh, verses 31 and uh, following, what we have here is the veil. Now, the veil is mentioned six times in the New Testament. It's amazing um, the, uh, what the New Testament says about the veil. But now, as you read here in Exodus 26 and verse 31, and thou shalt make a veil. Again, see, the veil was a curtain. It was this curtain that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. It was a curtain, a veil, however you want to uh, refer to it. And then it says, uh, and it was made of blue, purple, and scarlet. These are the three colors that uh, you had interwoven in this uh, veil, this curtain. And blue, as many have said, that uh, uh, reminds us of the sky. You look up into the sky and uh, possibly talking about Christ and how he came from heaven. Uh, he uh, was God who came to man to die uh, for our sins. And then uh, um, we have there uh, purple. And of course, uh, purple in the Bible speaks of royalty. And we know that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19 and verse, um, uh, verse 16. And then scarlet, of course, that is used in the Bible different things, but certainly reminds us of blood, you see, and how Christ shed uh, his blood. And then um, the Bible says there in verse 31, and um, of fine twine linen of cunning work with the cherubims thou shalt, uh, uh, shall it be made. Now, we read there about cherubims. We don't want to get over, uh, over anybody's head, but uh, the cherubims we read in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24, say they are uh, the protectors of the holiness of God. They are some type of exalted angelic creatures, but they guard the holiness of God. Say why? Because say right on the other side of this veil dwelt the presence of God. See, and that's where the presence of God uh, dwelt. Now, uh, if anybody would go in there, even the high priest outside of the Day of Atonement, they'd be struck dead on uh, the spot. So uh, the cherubims are the protectors of the holiness of God. Now, it's very clear as we study about uh, the veil, uh, the, the purpose and the meaning of the veil. See, uh, this curtain reminded us that man is a sinner and man cannot approach God apart from the blood that was um, sprinkled there in the um, Holy of Holies on Day of Atonement. So see, uh, obviously it uh, shuts man out uh, because man is a sinner and man cannot enter the presence of God. But then uh, it also obviously is a um, reminder, uh, you see, that uh, God is a holy God. We don't come to God on our terms. We must come to God on his uh, uh, terms. See, and the only way anybody could approach the holy of holies, you see, was on the basis of blood. And that was once a year on the day of uh, uh, atonement. And that's very, very uh, interesting. Now, somebody tell me this morning, what do our Jewish friends do on the Day of Atonement? Yom Kippur. Now, you see, the Day of Atonement was just that one time a year when the uh, priest would sprinkle, the high priest would sprinkle the blood in uh, the Holy of Holies. Now, what do our Jewish uh, friends do today on the Day of Atonement? They 
They fast. They fast. And what is the purpose of their fasting? It's a day uh, of fasting. And it's a day of prayer and repentance. See, uh, that's the day that the Jewish people are to repent of their sins. Now, uh, our Jewish friends today do not use any blood on the Day of Atonement because they don't have a, um, a tabernacle or a temple to uh, shed the blood at. So uh, they eliminate that. And so there's no blood in a modern day Day of Atonement, but there is repentance, see? And that's a time when they are to repent of their sin. And a lot of the very devout Jews will, um, will cry out to God, God, forgive me of my sins. I, I repent of my sin. And it's a day of national uh, repentance as it was in uh, the Old Testament. So that's very interesting as we think about it. But now, you see, right there, before we go, go in any further, you see, uh, the Day of Atonement was a day of repentance and the application of the blood. Now, see, that uh, speaks to us today. You see, what is salvation all about? Say, repentance and the blood. So you have repentance and you have the blood, and those things go hand in hand in um, the uh, Word of God. Now, see, as you turn to the New Testament, you find that that word, that curtain or veil, was mentioned six times in uh, the New Testament. Now, uh, as we think of the New Testament um, uh, temple uh, that was based on uh, the model of the Old Testament tabernacle. Now, we don't want to go over anybody's head, but this is good foundational material that every child of God ought to understand. And if we understand it, it'll help us to understand the Bible, Christ, salvation, and a lot of other things in a, in a much better way. Now, first of all, when we study the Word of God, we have the Old Testament tabernacle. And all the dimensions and all of the details about that are given in the book of Exodus. We've been reading about it and studying about it. And if you get the chart, you can see what the tabernacle uh, is all about. Now, that's the first organized way that God instructed his people to worship God, say, to worship him. The first organized way. Now, um, they gave sacrifices before this time, but there, were, uh, there was no tabernacle, there was no altar, there was no holy place, there was no uh, holy of holy. So um, we have the Old Testament tabernacle, and then later on, say the son of David, Solomon, built a tremendous temple. See, and we refer to that, and everybody has heard about, say, Solomon's Temple. So now, you see, and that was an ornate, uh, magnificent structure, but here's the thing to keep in mind. See, it was based uh, on the tabernacle. See, you had the Holy of Holies, you had the holy place, you had the laver, you had the brazen uh, altar. See, so that was a great embellishment of the Old Testament tabernacle. But, see, all the major features in the tabernacle were uh, embellished in the Temple of Solomon. Now, that Temple of Solomon was destroyed in 586 B.C. when the Babylonians came in and we're studying about that on Wednesday night, the book of Jeremiah, um, they, uh, they destroyed the temple. They destroyed Solomon's temple. Uh, it was uh, leveled to the ground, literally. That, that temple of Solomon was leveled to the ground, um, and that was destroyed. Now, uh, can somebody tell me who basically was re responsible for the oversight of the third temple? Anybody... Uh, know uh, who that was. And that's a man by the name of Zerubbabel. See, and then we refer to it as Zerubbabel's temple because he was a governor of the land at that time. They allowed the Jews to go back after the 70-year captivity. And so they built what is like the third tabernacle. And, um, and so that was the, uh, the temple of uh, Zerubbabel, who was the governor, the Jewish governor of the land 
and then he built it. And then uh, as we uh, think about this matter, see, then you had the temple uh, in Jesus' day. See, the temple that he referred to as my father's house. That was a temple where as a baby, he was offered up to the Lord and dedicated uh, to the Lord. Now, that was a temple, and, and that's where Jesus went to worship. That's when they observed the Passover. That's where they would uh, 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 observe it in relation to the uh, New Testament temple. Now, can somebody tell me who built that temple that Jesus and his apostles worshipped? Who built that temple? Say, was it Zerubbabel's temple or was it some other temple? See, now all of this is very, very instructive, and many times we're not nearly instructed in the Word of God as we should, and we don't get a hold of the Bible as we should. Now, you remember that was referred to as Herod's temple. Now, who was Herod? Herod was a monster. He was a wicked, ungodly man. He's the man that ordered all of the babies two years and under to be slaughtered in the city of Bethlehem. Who was that? That was Herod. He was the one that wanted to murder the baby Jesus. Now, earlier in his life, uh, you see, he is the one that embellished the temple. And he made the Jewish temple, that would have been Zerubbabel's temple, a magnificent edifice. Now, now he was an Edomite. And, uh, but say he was the governor of the land under Roman rule. Say the Romans ruled the world. He was the governor. And so uh, there are a lot of theories why he built this ornate temple, which was uh, one of the uh, wonders of the world, so to speak. It, uh, they say it was a marvelous thing about uh, a 30 uh, soccer fields Huge. It was a huge uh, temple. And again, that's where Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple. Now, and it was a tremendous edifice. Now, some believe that Herod did that because he was obsessed with uh, uh, being an architect and building and building projects and architecture. So as a result of it, he was obsessed with this. So now he wanted to make his mark for all time to build this uh, ornate, huge uh, Jewish temple. Again, say he was a governor of the land. He was an Edomite. So he did that uh, possibly because of his own ego. See, he wanted to have the uh, most ornate building in that part of the world named after him. And if that was a reason, he did succeed. See, today, uh, you look in your Bible dictionaries, you have a study Bible, it refers to Herod's uh, temple. Now, another reason why, and nobody knows why he uh, embellished this temple and made such a uh, grandiose edifice out of this temple. See, nobody knows for sure. Maybe his own ego, and then another reason, he, um, some believe that he maybe wanted just to pacify the Jews, see, to get on the good side of the Jews. So that means he'd get on the good side of the Roman emperor, and they'd have a good word to say about him uh, as the governor of um, the, the land. Now, we don't know. Nobody knows. See, uh, uh, just speculation. Now, another reason is that some people did that, uh, that believe that he did that to get on the good side of the Jewish people so that when the Messiah would come, he could murder the Messiah. Now, uh, but we don't know why Herod built the temple. That's just speculation. And uh, your guess is as good uh, as, uh, as mine. But he greatly embellished it. Now, the veil, the curtain that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. See, again, it was built on the model of the Old Testament tabernacle, but of course, greatly embellished. See, you had uh, the tabernacle area, you had the holy place, and you had those same three pieces of furniture in the holy place, and then you had the veil, and then you have the Holy of Holies. Now, the only thing is the, she the Shekinah glory was not there. See, in that sense, that uh, that was done away uh, uh, years uh, earlier. But now, 
You see, you had this veil in Herod's temple, again, where Jesus cast the money changers out, where Jesus worshipped, where the apostles worshipped. Now, and um, so uh, we find as we study the word of God that it, the, or, or the veil was 60 feet high. That's five and a half stories high. Over three times the height of the top of this uh, ceiling. See, it was huge. Like I said, see, it was a magnificent structure. They tell us that uh, probably made out of white marble. And it was uh, like 30 soccer fields uh, big. It was a tremendous structure. And um, now most everybody believes that it was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide and four inches thick. It was like a, a huge rug, a curtain, a, a, a veil. Now, in Herod's temple, you see, that veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. See, and when the Jewish people would worship God, they would uh, come uh, to this temple. They say that that veil, if you had two sets of oxen at each end of the veil, they could not pull it apart. It was such a, uh, a strong uh, a fabric, like a rug. It's, uh, uh, you can't pull a rug apart with your own uh, hands and strength. And then uh, they tell us that when it was originally put up in Herod's temple, uh, the temple that he embellished and built and so forth, uh, you see, it took 300 priests to put that veil in place. 300 men to put the veil uh, in place. So that's the uh, veil that we read about in the New Testament. That's why we said all of this to help us better understand the New Testament teaching about the veil. Now, if you don't understand the Old Testament, teaching about the veil, you might not understand the New Testament teaching about the veil. Now, uh, both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three Gospels tell us that the veil in Herod's temple was rent in twain. It was cut from the top to the bottom when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. See, that veil was rent in two. We read about it in Matthew 27, 51 through 53, Mark 15, 38, and Luke 23, 45. Say all three of those gospels mention that when Jesus Christ died, that that veil was cut from the top to the bottom, 30 feet wide, 60 feet uh, uh, high. And so uh, we read about that very clearly in uh, the gospel uh, records. Now, see, all three of those gospels uh, mention that. See, what's it talking about? Well, it's talking about what we read this morning in Exodus 26. See, that veil uh, that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, but now in Jesus' day, it was located in, the, um, uh, in Herod's temple. Let's read about it, for instance, in uh, Matthew chapter 27. Now, in Matthew chapter uh, 27 in verses uh, 51 and, uh, uh, and following. Now, it's Matthew chapter 27 and verse uh, 51 and following. And it says here, and behold, Je uh, this is Matthew uh, 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom See, not from the bottom to the top. It was divine. God did it. And then the Bible says the earth did quake. Very neglected passage in the Bible. And the rocks burst open when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And, um, and the graves were open. They were split open when Jesus died on the cross. It's amazing what took place when Jesus died on the cross. And came out of the graves. People came out of their graves. They started walking around in the city of Jerusalem. So you read about it in verse 53. And they came out of the graves, uh, say, after his resurrection. Of course, he's the first fruits. And they went into the holy city and appeared unto 
uh, many. So what we have here in the Word of God, say the veil of the temple was rent in twain. We read about the same thing in uh, Mark chapter 15 and the same thing in Luke chapter 23. Say all uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us how this veil was torn in half from the top to the bottom in Herod's temple. That was a temple in existence when Jesus Christ, uh, you see, died on the, uh, uh, on the cross. Now, now, what are the obvious lessons that we learn here in the word of God? Now, say that temple, um, the veil of that temple, that curtain was, was cut into from the top to uh, the bo bottom. Now, number one, it obviously uh, teaches us that all of the Old Testament uh, laws and ceremonies and priesthood are now done away with. See, now every child of God has direct access to God. See, the priesthood is done away with. The, uh, the law is done away with. The Old Testament ceremonies are done away with. Why don't we observe the dietary laws of the Old Testament? See, they were done away when the temple, uh, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Why don't we bring an animal and slay an animal at an altar? See, all of that was done away. Jesus was the Lamb of God. And um, so all of those things were done away with in relation to the Old Testament. Uh, uh, law. Now, you see, um, today the Bible teaches you and I do not need priest today to intercede for us on behalf of God. See, see the Bible teaches in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 5 and 9, say we are all priests unto God today. If we're saved, we have direct access to God. See, there are no priests today. Now that's why, and this might help some of our Roman Catholic friends to understand uh, the Bible, is that, say, when you read and study about the New Testament church, now in the church age today, uh, since uh, 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 the resurrection uh, of Christ until the rapture of the church age, say so you never read about a priest in relation to the church. Now you have pastors, you have teachers, you have evangelists, so forth, but you never read about a priest. So you can read the Bible from uh, Romans to Revelation, and the Bible never talks about uh, a priest that represents God's children. Why? Say so all that was done away with. That's unscriptural. That is not biblical. It's not found in the word of God. For instance, you can challenge anybody. Where, show me where you find a priest in the New Testament church. You can't. It's not there. There's no verses along that line. And uh, see, the priesthood was done away with. Now, every child of God has direct access to uh, uh, the Father. But now, of course, see, what you have here with this uh, uh, veil is that it's possibly the greatest object lesson in all the Bible. The greatest object lesson in all the Bible. Now, a lot of times people use illustrations or uh, some type of an object uh, to uh, illustrate Bible truth. Well, uh, the thing about it, say here in the Bible, say the, the, the rent veil is the greatest object lesson in all the Bible. See, this is God's object lesson. When Jesus Christ died on the cross in that Jewish temple, known as Herod's temple in Jesus' day, that veil was split in two from the top to the bottom. See, and obviously it reminds us of the fact that now the way to heaven has been opened up through the cross, through the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross of Calvary. It reminds us not only that the way of heaven is open, but obviously, say, the way of forgiveness is now open, but it's only open on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. See, so it's a great object lesson as we study uh, the Word of God. Now, turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10. You see, and all of this is um, clearly brought out in the book of Hebrews. Now, in Hebrews chapter 10 
and verse 19. Hebrews 10 and verse 19, the Bible says, having therefore, brethren, say boldness. Say we have boldness, Hebrews 10, 19, to enter into the holiest. Now what's that talking about? The holy of holies. Say you and I as a child of God have the boldness to enter the presence of God. Say that's the great wonderful truth of the New Testament. And then it goes on. And it says, by the blood of Christ, not our righteousness, not our goodness, not some priest, not some mediator, not a pope, not a rabbi, not a pastor, but on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. Say, you and I have direct access to God in prayer and uh, so forth now because of the blood of Christ. Now, look at the next verse in Hebrews 10 and verse 20 by a new and a living way, which he hath consecrated, or he hath dedicated. He dedicated the way to God. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ and his blood on the cross. There is no other way to God apart from what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Now, see what it says here. For us, that is through the veil. See, that's talking about, the, see, I said, it's mentioned six times in the New Testament. Now here, he says, through the veil. And um, the Bible uh, says now in verse 20, that is to say, his flesh. In other words, his body was the veil. Now, a lot of people get mixed up here. It has nothing to do with his earthly life. It's not talking about how he lived upon the earth. But uh, when it says here, through his flesh, it's talking about uh, how violently... They treated the body of Jesus Christ. It was beaten. They stabbed it with a sword. They nailed, uh, put nails in his hands and his feet, you see. And he was tortured and he was brutalized, uh, you see. And that body was torn. And that is a picture of the previous verse, what happened to the veil. It was torn asunder it was torn from the top to the bottom just like the body of Jesus Christ was torn see it was brutalized see um, there on uh, Calvary it was violently uh, uh, treated so you see the Bible teaches this is a great object lesson his body was the veil but see that that um, that body was tortured and brutalized and say, through the rending of his body, you and I have direct access to God. We can have salvation, forgiveness, uh, and an open door in relation to prayer. And it all has to do with the, the great object lesson that that veil was a picture of his body. Say, that was slain and uh, treated in such a torturous way. And that's why in Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, uh, speaking of um, uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper, said, this is my blood, see, which is shed for the remission of sins. Now, a lot of liberal churches, a lot of ch church they preach, oh, Jesus Christ was a great example and martyr and that type of thing. That's totally unbiblical. Anybody preach that, you know, they're not saved. They don't know the Bible. See, he said, I'm gonna shed my blood in a little while on the cross of Calvary, for the remission of sins. That word remission is the word forgiveness. He's shedding his blood so sins can be forgiven. See, that's why he shed his blood. Say, anybody here this morning and you don't know that your sins are forgiven, you don't have that assurance, you can have the assurance that your sins are forgiven. Why? Because Jesus Christ shed his blood to forgive you of your sin. That's why in Revelation 1.5, it says that his blood washes away, see, who loved us and uh, he gave himself for us, see, so that our sins could be washed away in his blood. See, when we come and we accept Christ as Savior, our sins are washed away. We not only sing about it, and a lot of people don't like to sing about it, but it's biblical. See, the blood of Christ washes, cleanses us of our sin. In Revelation seven fourteen. It makes us white. We now are white in the sight of God. 
They washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, and now they're white in the sight of uh, a God. Now, so that's a great truth of the Bible. See, it's a very simple truth, but it's a great truth, say, as you go way back to the Old Testament tabernacle. See, the curtain, the veil, separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Jesus Christ uh, came. He died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, at that time, the veil of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, 60 feet high, five and a half stories high, was rent and cut in two from the top to the bottom. That's probably why in the early chapters of the book of Acts, the Bible says many priests became obedient unto the faith. Now, if you were a priest in that temple, that certainly should wake you up and give you a wake-up call that you need to receive Christ as your Savior. See, what's going on? That's the time. That's the very moment Jesus died. You put it together. He's the Messiah. And uh, the Bible says many of those priests turned to the Lord probably because of that. But now, you see, this is the wonderful truth that our sins can be forgiven because of this object lesson. This curtain, five and a half stories high, uh, four inches thick, 30 feet wide, was uh, cut, rent, rent from the top to uh, the bottom. Now, how can you and I know that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died to forgive me of my sins, and how can I know he did that on the cross? that he shed his blood for me. Now, the Bible says Christ died for our sins. Now, in other words, he died to forgive us of our sins. Now, how do we know that? Now, you know, it's very, very illuminating to study the Bible about the verifications of God's truth that are found in the Bible. You see, how God verifies his truth. And there are many verifications in the Bible of various Bible truths. But the thing we're getting at, turn there to Matthew chapter 27. A very neglected passage in the Bible is Matthew chapter 27. Many have never heard of it. Many have never really studied it out. Now, in Matthew 27 and verses 51 and uh, following, we have about four ways that God verified that Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive me of my sins, and I do not need a priest. I do not need an intercessor or someone who is a mediator, but I can go directly to God. You see, through, see, the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. Now, what verified that? In Matthew chapter, now this is very, very insightful when you study your Bible. Say, now, of course, many have heard the Gospel of Matthew is probably written to the Jew or to Jewish people. He says more about prophecies being fulfilled and so forth than any of the other uh, Gospels. But whatever, uh, in Matthew chapter 27, and we read here, in verse 51, see, and uh, see, well, verse 50, and Jesus, when he had cried again, see, with a loud voice, he gave up his life. He had still had a lot of strength on Calvary. He didn't die of a brain tumor or a, a heart uh, uh, condition or something like that. But you see, he gave up the ghost. He yielded up his life on the cross. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. Never get over Calvary. If you get over Calvary, you'll get over the Christian life. You have no joy, blessing, victory in your life. Turn your eyes upon uh, Calvary. Now, the Bible says here in verse 51 of Matthew 27, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent, cut into, say, from the top to the bottom. God did it. You see, God made atonement for sin. 
God satisfied himself when Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary. That's why you can be forgiven of your sins. If you're not forgiven, you don't know you're forgiven. You can be, not because of Pastor Gent or uh, anything uh, like that, but because Jesus died on the cross. Now, see, that was God's object lesson of God saying, I approved of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary because he rent the veil. And this literally took place in that uh, Jewish temple in Jesus' day. But look what it uh, goes on and says. And, um, from the, uh, and the earth did quake. Do you realize that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, there was an earthquake and the earth shook? Why? It had to shake. Its creator was being crucified. The creator of earth is being put to death. And when he was put to death on Calvary, that shook, you see, the earth. And well, it should have, amen? Uh, well, it should have. See, and there was an earthquake at that time. And then the Bible says, and the rock split open. The, the rocks, uh, what's it mean? It says they split open. So Why? The creator of the universe is dying for your sin and for my sin. See, and this verifies that he died for you. See, now, the next thing it says, and the graves were opened. That's an amazing thing. When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, there were graves in the um, city of Jerusalem, evidently of uh, bygone Jewish uh, believers or those who believe in the Lord. And the Bible says the graves were open and many, not some, not a few, many, you see, bodies of the saints which slept arose or bodies in the grave. And now their bodies are resurrected when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Now, see, it goes on and explains that and went into the holy city and appeared uh, uh, but it says in verse 53, uh, and they came out of the graves, say, after his resurrection. All these holy, mighty, uh, wonderful things happened. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, and that's why I see what the next verse says in all the Gospels. The next thing, now when the centurion, see the, the uh, military man in charge, and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the, the earthquake and uh, those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. What? After they saw all these things happen, when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. And I believe that uh, in all probability that that uh, soldier in charge, when you read all the gospels, put it all together, he came to know the Lord. See, he was trusting that he was a son of God. He came from God. What he did somehow was miraculous on that cross. But that's another subject. But you see, um, it's very interesting. Now, that was God's sign to you and to me that Jesus Christ died for my sins. There's an earthquake, the rock split open, and many of the saints, the graves were split open, and after the resurrection of Christ, they uh, came forth, as it says there. And um, uh, they came out of the graves after his resurrection. Of course, Christ is the first fruits. Now, to any good Jewish person that studies the Bible, Say, all of this was prophesied. Now, we know as Christians today, Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement, our peace was upon him. Now, we know that. We know uh, Psalm 22. Certain Old Testament scriptures that remind us that he died on Calvary. You probably heard it if you didn't. Psalm 22 is one of the most uh, exact descriptions of crucifixion 700 years before the crucifixion uh, uh, ever took place, before the uh, people introduced it. Uh, you have Psalm 22, you see, and that's the, the crucifixion 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, even quoted uh, in the Gospels. But there's an amazing thing in the Bible that very few people have ever discovered or got into. And let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, here's where I disagree with a lot of prophetic Bible teachers. Now, a lot of prophetic Bible teachers are filled with hot air. They're really not as scriptural as they should be. They quote 27 verses to prove their point and never explain one verse. Now, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. Now, uh, we have a, an interesting passage here in the Word of God. Now, that's why when you study your Bible, you see there are, when you study about Old Testament prophecy, see, like many uh, of those Old Testament prophecies refer to Jesus Christ, but first of all, they had a local fulfillment. You see, like uh, the virgin birth, that had a local fulfillment, and then we know it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Why? Matthew chapter 1 says that Isaiah prophesied the virgin birth. So see, in Bible prophecy, many times there's a local fulfillment or, and then a future fulfillment. And many prophecies like that have been applied to Christ when you study the prophecies. Now, like this prophecy here, uh, all, I, I, every Bible teacher say, they, this is Israel. Well, I believe it applies to Israel, but many Bible prophecies have a double fulfillment. And if you don't understand that, you'll not understand Bible prophecy. See, it has a double fulfillment. Maybe a local, a future, and then another. See, and I believe this also applies to Jesus Christ. Now, you see, uh, as you turn to Ezekiel chapter 37, and you read here in verse uh, 12. Now, he says, therefore prophesy, and remember, Matthew's written to the Jew. Most everybody says primarily. It's written for everybody today. I mean, it's a powerful gospel for any Gentile. But, uh, you know, a lot of people do re refer to that. But um, Ezekiel 37, verse 12, the Bible says, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people. And what's it say? What's it say? I will open your graves. Now, here's an interesting thing. When did that take place? When ever in the history of Israel were their graves open? You see? See what we're getting at? You see? And it says uh, in verse 12, uh, I will open your graves and come and cause you to come forth out of your graves. Now, I take that literal. I believe that's a literal prophecy in relation to the cross of Calvary. And remember, when Jesus taught his disciples, remember he said he, he taught them uh, from the scriptures beginning at Moses. And remember what he said, and all the prophets that spoke of me, that spoke of me. See, the Old Testament is full of Jesus if we really study it. Most people don't study it and they don't get Jesus in the Old Testament. But it says here, and I'll open your graves and I'm going to cause you to come up out of your graves. Well, when did it say in the Bible teachers or prophecy, that's Israel in the future. Well, I think it could apply to Israel in the future, but I believe it's literal. See, and I believe it refers to when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Now, you see, and it says, and cause you to come up out of your graves. Now, when did that ever happen? When is that going to happen in the nation of Israel? See, it's never happened. See, and I believe this is referring to Matthew. And, um, and then he says, and bring you into the land of Israel. Now, he says, and ye shall know that I'm the Lord. How do you know that Jesus Christ is the Lord? How do you know that Jesus Christ was God who died on the cross 
to forgive me of my sins and to forgive you of your sins if you repent and turn to him and receive him. See what it says in verse 13. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. You see, that's exactly what Matthew said. The graves were opened. And I believe that's a direct relation to here in Ezekiel 37. And now he says here, and ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Now, I believe that could have application to Israel to a certain degree, but I believe the primary interpretation is to what Matthew said in Matthew 27. The graves were opened. How do you know Jesus was God who died for our sins? Because, you see, the veil of the temple was written twain, and when that happened, the graves were opened. And the Bible says many went out of those graves into the city of Jerusalem. See, we don't hear about that very much. That's scriptural, that's Bible, you see. And that's why, in a sense, there was ample um, witness given to the city of Jerusalem through the rent veil, and then after the resurrection of Christ, they went to the graveyard and they say, hey, these tombs are open. These graves, uh, uh, my aunt was buried, my brother, my father was buried in this grave, and, and uh, they're, they're all ripped open. And then a person's father comes back to the city of Jerusalem and starts witnessing because he was saved. See, God gave tremendous testimony to Calvary, to the cross, to the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why we never want to take it in a light way. Again, go back to Matthew. But you see what it says here in Ezekiel 37. And he says here, and ye shall know I'm the Lord. See, those priests in the temple should have known that he was the Lord. Those people who went back and witnessed in the city of Jerusalem. You say, now, did everybody get saved as a result of witness? No. Jesus said in relation to uh, rich man Lazarus, somebody rose from the dead. They, they come back. They wouldn't believe. Well, here people did rise from dead. They came back. And uh, hopefully some did uh, uh, believe. But anyway, it's uh, amazing as you study the Bible. And I believe that that has a fulfillment, Ezekiel 37, 12 and 13, in Jesus Christ, even to us today. How do I know my sins can be forgiven? Now, there's a lot of things we might not know. There's a lot of theology we might not understand. There's a, a lot of things in a Christian life we might all have question about. But the Bible is crystal clear. There's one thing you can know. Jesus Christ died for your sins. You can know that. That's a given in the Bible. And all of these great proofs. Now, and then, of course, we don't have time to get into it. Three days later, he himself rises from the dead. Amen? He himself comes forth from the grave. And then these others at that time, evidently according to the scripture, and there's no way you can get around it. See, there's no way you can uh, fudge these verses. These are clear in the word of God and Matthew. And um, so there's a great witness. The resurrection proves that Jesus Christ died for my sins, that I can be forgiven of my sins. Now, again, there's a lot of things we might not know about. And that's why, uh, be very honest, I'm a little leery of a lot of prophetic Bible teachers. They think they know it all. Well, I'll leave it to God. God's going to unravel it, amen, in his time and in his way. We need to be careful of thinking that we know as much as God knows. And then we have to take scripture out of context to prove our position. See, and then they think they know more uh, than anybody else. Now, uh, the thing about it is the main thing in the gospel is the word of God is the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
See, what did Paul preach? What did Peter preach? What did Peter say? We're redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. What's that mean? We're set free from the penalty of our sin through the blood of Jesus. Peter, John, uh, Paul, the teaching of the word of God. Uh, 1 John 1, 7. Uh, what's it say? See, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. See, when you get away from the blood, you've gotten away from the book. When you get away from the blood, you've gotten away from the gospel. You see, the blood of Christ. Now, see, what we're talking about is the Old Testament tabernacle. See, that's God's great object lesson, that you can go directly to God in prayer. You don't need a priest. See, that teaches that he paid the price. Now the way of forgiveness, the way to heaven, praise God, is open. Not because of anything I can do or my good works or anything in my life, but I can be forgiven through what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross of Calvary. That should cause a Presbyterian to shout, Amen. To think that what Jesus Christ did for us. That he died to forgive us of our sin. And we as wicked, undone uh, sinners can be washed as white as snow through his blood. And the great object lesson of that. See the tabernacle? The temple? Herod's temple? That's the great object lesson. It was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Jesus Christ's body was tortured, brutalized, torn on Calvary so that the way of forgiveness might be opened up. Let's bow in prayer. As our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, I wonder uh, this morning, do you really know Jesus in the forgiveness of your sins? Can you say, I know my sins have been forgiven on the basis of his blood. The blood of Christ cleanses it from all sin. And... Uh, you say, uh, Pastor, I realize a way of forgiveness is open because Jesus Christ died for me. And Pastor, I want his forgiveness. I know I'm a sinner and I want to turn from my sin. I don't want to keep living in my sin. That's called, called repentance. And you say, Pastor, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe Jesus Christ did die on that cross to forgive me of my sins. And Pastor, I want to come to him. I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior and one who will forgive me of all my sins. As our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, I wonder, is there someone like that this morning? Maybe you're here for the first time. Maybe you've been here a hundred times. But you say, Pastor, I want to enter in to the blessing of knowing my sins are forgiven through what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And you raise your hand. And then as we think of the gospel, see, being a witness for Christ is not arguing with somebody about religion. It's presenting the blood. The finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. That's the only way to be saved. And that's our job, to be a light in the world, to tell others that the work has been done. It's not due, but done by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And we can know through Jesus Christ. Now again, not through a priest or not through a ceremony or not through a baptism. No, but through Jesus Christ, we can know that our sins are forgiven. And that's the, the, the message that we have, no matter when a dope addict or murderer or a drunkard or the, the best Baptist in the, in the countryside, uh, Presbyterian, Methodist, you name it. Uh, anybody who really acknowledges they're a sinner can be forgiven of their sin. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and now he gave him on the cross of Calvary. And then if you've been saved, how can you not want to openly profess Christ in the waters of believer's baptism? How can I be saved and say I love Jesus and not publicly take my stand? It has nothing to do with salvation, it has to do with the public stand. I want others to know I've accepted him. And I'm not ashamed of that.
Do you need to come for baptism? Whatever, I trust God will uh, speak to our hearts as we uh, go to the Lord. Our Father, help us, we pray. Lord, we thank Thee for the rich, and Lord, we just hit the highlights of the teaching about the veil and how that veil was rent in two when Jesus Christ died on Calvary. We thank Thee, Lord, for Your Word. We thank Thee, Lord, as unworthy as we are, we now have access to Your presence. We have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies on the basis of the blood of Christ. We thank Thee for it, and we pray in Jesus' name.